Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to let a few more people trickle in, uh, but I would just like to welcome you all uh, to today's uh, event with Attorney General Keith Ellison. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Miller, and I am the co-president of the Twin Cities chapter of the American Constitution Society, uh, and I welcome you all to today's important conversation. Uh, so for those that are not aware of what the American Constitution Society is, uh, we are the nation's largest progressive legal organization uh, that is dedicated to upholding the Constitution by ensuring that it's a force for protecting our democracy and for, for improving people's lives. So our organization uh, makes up a wide range of people, including lawyers, judges, scholars, law students, uh, who are helping leading this debate forward and making up our progressive legal community. Uh, so today is obviously a very uh, important discussion with a very important person who has played a very critical role uh, in our society in the last couple of years. And so for those that, that have been paying attention, both locally in Minnesota, but also nationally, uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison and his office has been at the center of some of the most pressing issues facing Minnesota and our nation, uh, including the prosecution of the former uh, police officers involved in the murder of George Floyd, uh, enforcing the COVID restrictions and COVID regulations, uh, many important abortion rulings, both locally and nationally, and as well as with all of this going on, also finding time to innovate the office and to make sure the Attorney General's office is working for all uh, Minnesotans, such as his conviction review, review unit, which we're hoping to hear a little bit about uh, today. Uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison is also the honorary co-chair of the uh, American Constitution Society's Board of Advisors, and we are thrilled uh, that he has joined us in this conversation. So as a few preliminary matters, uh, the American Constitution Society is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, so we do not endorse or oppose any candidates for, uh, for office or political parties. And so any views expressed uh, by uh, Attorney General Ellison or any of speakers today reflect their individual opinions and should not be reflected upon the American Constitution Society. Uh, we've also applied for CLE credits uh, we will put the code in the chat, but for those that have pen and paper ready, uh, it is 470-697. Uh, it is also in the event page. Uh, we have reserved some time for questions, so please submit them in the uh, question and answer function on the uh, bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be recording this event. Uh, and a couple other matters that are upcoming for the American Constitution Society on October 13th, for those that have uh, attended, attended previously, we are hosting our uh, ACS Progressive Law Benefit. Uh, we will once again be joined by Tane Danger of the Theater of Public Policy, and he will be uh, featuring several uh, local luminaries who will participate in the trivia show. And it's just a great night, a great opportunity. And Attorney General Ellison actually uh, participated last year. Uh, and lastly, if you're not a member already, uh, please go to acslaw.org and sign up so that we can continue providing programming uh, such as today and to work on many of the issues uh, that you're going to hear about. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to the moderator for today's event, uh, John Schmidt. So he is an assistant Hennepin County attorney for the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. Uh, and he heads up, the, for the moment, the Special Litigation Division, the appeals unit for the entire office. And he's also a member of our board of directors. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to John. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, we're honored today to be joined by Minnesota's Attorney General Keith Ellison. Uh, he needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you a short one anyways. Uh, prior to being elected Attorney General uh, for Minnesota in 2018, Attorney General Ellison was a congressman for Minnesota's 5th Congressional District from 2007 to 19. He was the first Muslim ever to be elected to Congress and the first African-American representative from Minnesota. Also the first Muslim in the entire United States to win statewide office. Uh, Attorney General Ellison has a lot of experience uh, prior to his time in Congress. He was in private practice uh, at several different law firms in town and he spent a lot of time representing indigenous clients when he was the executive director of the Legal Rights Center. Uh, Attorney General, thank you so much for being here today. Hey, what a pleasure. Thank you all for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, I, I want to start uh, with your time as Attorney General since 2019, uh, when you're sworn into office. Uh, it, it hasn't been, I mean, to put it lightly, it's not been an easy couple of years. Uh, so I wanted to start by checking in with you as a human being. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, have you been able to be able to, you know, take care of yourself during this time and uh, take some rest? 
You know, uh, thankfully I have, you know, I've, I've, I'm riding, I'm uh, riding my bike. I'm uh, going on jogs, spending good time with my wife. You know, we're, it's been, uh, I make sure that I do that because if you, I will say this to every, uh, everybody on the call, if you don't take care of yourself, you will burn out and then you can't keep on trying to do the work that you're called to do. So uh, even if you don't feel like taking a break, take one, take a walk, spend time in nature. Uh, that's what I, that's what I recommend. Oh, good. Good. Um, well, let's jump right in with some of the more recent uh hard uh, news that we've had and with Roe and Dobbs. Oh, yeah. Uh, in Minnesota, we have Doe versus Gomez that protects a woman's right to choose under the state constitution. But what are you hearing from your fellow attorney generals around the country about the uh, effect of Dobbs? Well, Dobbs is having uh, a devastating effect. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, there was a case uh, in uh, Louisiana where uh, now you have uh, a proposal a bill introduced in the Louisiana State House that would make uh, abortion uh, a homicide under Louisiana law. Uh, you know, that, that was defeated, uh, but uh, it was strenuously debated. And the fact that we're even discussing this tells you, you know, something pretty, pretty bad in my view. Uh, you know, also everybody knows about the case uh, in, in, you know, in Ohio and Indiana with the 10 year old. Uh, but that that's a reality that, uh, you know, we're dealing with as well. Um, and, you know, you got 10 year old child, uh, you, you know, being being, uh, you know, in the middle of whether or not she should get an abortion well below the age of any kind of consent, clearly statutory rape. But at the same time, you know, here we are fighting over whether this child uh, would have to take this pregnancy to term. Um, so, so there's, it's just really all over the, in, in Mich good news in Michigan, good news in Kansas. In Kansas, people said, uh, you're not going to jam this down our throat, right? And people showed up. And I think you're going to have a lot of bipartisan, bipartisan unity around people's basic rights to privacy. And in Michigan, there was a 1931 law that said that abortion was illegal. Uh, and yet uh, the governor and the attorney general uh, took action to uh, to suspend the um, application of that law. And I, I think this is going to be resolved in the fall. So there's a lot of activity, a lot of activity, but even that is a bad thing. I mean, look, in states like Michigan, Minnesota, I mean, we all know that in the upcoming legislative session, uh, if there's not a clear, uh, if we have a split legislature, you will have uh, abortion related poison pills every day and every step of the way. And that's what they're going to force us to discuss rather than bonding bills and appropriations and things that the state needs to do. And then I will add this. A lot of people are concerned about the, con the, um, the uh, concurrence that, that was author offered by uh, Clarence Thomas, who said the quiet part out loud, uh, you know, and he, he would like to see states uh, ban contraception ban the right for, you know, in, take the Supreme Court take away the right, the federally guaranteed right for people to marry who they love. Uh, and so it, it really is um, been extremely disruptive. And that, that was, uh, I wanted to ask you about that because Dobbs was the first time the Supreme Court took away rights right. from people. And, and you know, it was a giant step backwards. And are, are you worried about that with what Justice Thomas said expressly in the concurrence about all the other rights that that he wants to reevaluate? I think that it is a very realistic possibility <clears throat> that in a state like Louisiana, they could ban contraception. There's a lot, there's, a, there's a other states like that, that would be willing to do the same thing. So now we're going to have the, uh, the birth control pill cops. I mean, and it's not far fetched. I mean, if they're trying, if, if there are people holding a straight face saying that abortion is homicide and the women should be prosecuted for murder, then you know that this has done nothing but embolden the most extreme elements uh, of our society. And um, they're not going to stop until they, until they get, get what they're looking for, which is some, um, some you know, vision of a, a handmaid's tale. You know? uh, and so that, that's really what we're, we're staring at right now. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this as well. Um, 
Clarence Thomas, who is married to a person of another ethnic background, I don't, I don't, what is the difference between marrying somebody of the same sex or marrying somebody of, of another race? It's premised on the idea, that the basic idea is that the individual marries who the heck they please in America, federally guaranteed. So whether, you know, I'm black and my wife is white or I'm male and my spouse is male too, that's up to me. Uh, it's not an endorsement of it, it's just, it's, it says that it's up to the person to decide. They, they are so closely related that I don't know how he can make a straight-faced um, decision uh, that distinguishes the two. So if one goes, the other does in my mind, uh, and yet he didn't seem to, uh, he didn't mention that in his concurrence. He did not, he did not mention that case in his concurrence. It was mm -hmm. notably absent, but it yeah. seems, your point is, is right on. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're in difficult times. If I could just note this, John, let me start everybody with Bush v. Gore. You're like, Bush v. Gore? What are you talking about? We'll take it back to Bush v. Gore, where you had a Supreme Court that basically said, stop the count, and who's ever in the lead, that's who's in the lead. They knew who was in the lead. And basically selected who the president was going to be. Um, then, fast forward, you know, you end up in 2013. Which is um, you get the uh, you get the Shelby County case, where despite numerous congressional hearings, reams of uh, transcripts uh, on voting, they say ah, so, you know Scalia, Roberts and Scalia say ah, uh, no 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 no, we 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 don't want to do the the section um, we don't want to do preclearance anymore. They just ignore completely ignore the congressional process. Now, these are the ones who run around saying, well, we just want to have this done constitutionally. Well, it was. Everybody in the Senate voted for it, and everyone but about 10 people in the House voted for the, re, you know, the, uh, the reenactment of the Voting Rights Act, and yet that was not good enough for the Supreme Court. So then you have things like Citizens United, which says that you know, in, we, endless money can be spent by corporations who are people too. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, a, new, a, a, run, a run of other decisions. I mean, if you look at the Bruin decision in New York, this is a decision where the people, a hundred year old statute where the people of New York said, you know what, we're going to leave it up to law enforcement for people to, to decide who needs a gun and who doesn't. We think it keeps our state safer. Uh, and then they, they were in the wake of, of Buffalo where they had a mass racially motivated murder. And the Supreme Court doesn't care at all and just says, skip your state statute and flips it. I mean, but even Dobbs is like a absurdly decided decision. I mean, it's saying, well, the only the only rights you have are the ones that are explicitly written in the con in the Constitution or are the ones that are quote unquote deeply rooted. Well, honestly, I, I would bet you around uh, more than half the people on this call today. Uh, no, no world without Roe versus Wade. 1973 decision for John, for you, Roe versus Wade is deeply rooted, yeah, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> you know, you know, you you were not alive for any other decision. So, I mean, I they but so they're so arbitrary. Uh, it really, I mean, the the sad reality is, the United States Supreme Court has gone from being. Uh, a, a, a judicial body which adjudicates legal matters to be an essentially an ideological, um, you know, and we've seen this before. I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, the Supreme Court between Plessy and uh, and uh, Lochner was, they just, they made decisions uh, based on what their preferences were without regard to what the people wanted. And that's what we have right now. And so I hope everybody who's an ACS member, um, particularly you guys who are on the younger end, think about becoming a judge. I mean, we need, it's an honorable profession when we need good ones. And if you have any questions about that, uh, just take a look at the newspaper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of, of judges in Ramsey County, we had uh, a decision on abortion that came out uh, in the last couple of months. Um, sure. And, uh, uh, Judge Gilligan struck down a number of statutes that restrict uh, women's uh, right to choose. 
And you decided not to appeal that decision. And, and to the extent you're able, can you tell us about your process and, and reviewing the decision? I know it was 140 pages or so. So it, it took a while to get through it and, and figure out what you wanted to do. Well, let me just say that as attorney general, you don't get to defend the laws that you like. You got to defend the law as it's written, except for if it is clearly unconstitutional. If the law is clearly preempted by federal law or unconstitutional, then you don't have to enforce that. Otherwise, you do, even if you don't like it. The truth is, a lot of the laws that uh, were that the uh, gender justice challenged, I was in the state legislature and voted no on. And yet, as attorney general, I, I did defend those laws because that's what the attorney general does. You have to defend the statutes. Well. We spent 4,000 hours doing it. We spent $600,000 doing it. Judge Gilligan uh, wrote what I consider to be a reasoned uh, opinion. Uh, and uh, at that point, I thought expenditure of more money and resources and time to appeal it was ill-advised. So we said, no, we said we're not. He said, we're done with this. We have litigated this long and as hard as we need to, and uh, it's over. And, and more than that, people need to know what the law is going to be. And by endlessly appealing stuff, all we do is just sort of create confusion at a time when people need clarity. So that's why, that's why we did it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've been good about talking about those. I, I was disappointed to see the press didn't talk about that up front. It was just about your decision not to appeal. But the, the fact is that, you know, Liz Kramer, the Solicitor General of Minnesota, was in court fighting this statute. And it's, you know, your personal beliefs, her personal beliefs, you set aside. But, yeah, she, you know, you had your top person in court litigating this for yeah. years. Well, let me just say we had our best appellate lawyer and folks may not know Liz Kramer, but if anybody knows her, they know that uh, she's top shelf man. she's really, really good. And, and, you know, she put her heart into it and look, Liz is pro-choice, <laughs> but she understands her duty. And so she did it. Now that doesn't mean that once we've done our duty that we got to keep on doing, I mean, look, the, these folks uh, don't want to look at the fact that we've, fought this thing tooth and nail, you know, for literally for years, briefed everything, reams and reams of pages of uh, well-briefed uh, issues here. Um, and so there, and so now it's over, right? And by the way, here's the thing. We don't appeal every case. Uh, we, we uh, the Otto Bremer case, we did not appeal that. I mean, we, we don't appeal every case, right? You know, we, there are cases we don't appeal. And it's and it's uh and it's a it's a strategic decision, uh, factoring in what our chances of success will be, what kind of money we're going to have to expend, what kind of staff do we have, the need for finality and therefore clarity. All these things come together, and you make a call, and that's what I did. And uh, so I'm I'm comfortable with the decision that I made. And uh, if I thought that Judge Gilligan made some significant legal error that I thought would flip the case, I might have considered everything a little differently, you know, but that's not what happened. So here we are. But uh, of course, you know, people think, well, you're pro-choice and you, you, you're, that's why you're doing this. I'm telling people that's not why I'm doing this, although it's true that I am very much pro-choice. I do think that uh, family decisions, reproductive choices should be up to the individual. I don't think the government is in a position to make that call. I don't think that six people wearing a black robe know uh, what a, a, a woman uh, should or should not do about her sub subjective personal family decisions. I think they ought to stay out of it, just like uh, Roe versus Wade uh, required. Well, uh, in, in their wisdom, the current configuration of the Supreme Court says the other thing, that it is the government's business. From the moment of conception, the instant of conception, the government now has an interest in dictating what happens in a woman's womb. I think that's horrendous. I think it's horrible. And I'm not going to make any apologies about that. Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, I can do my duty as attorney general and defense statutes and hold my personal views. And I think I've been doing both. I, I 
100% agree. Um, let me uh, go back in time a little bit and uh, in your tenure as attorney general. Uh, so you're sworn in in 2019 and then 2020 hits and the world changes as COVID spreads in the United oh, States. Boy. And so you, you had maybe a couple of months before you <laughs> had to start dealing with this and you had a lot of tough decisions. You're left to defend everything from the governor's executive orders, restrictions on businesses, mask mandates. Can you walk us through the COVID experience? Well, then, then let's add on it to price gouging, consumer frauds, online tricks. Uh, you know, I, did, did you mention the uh, eviction moratorium? You might have mentioned no. that one. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, it, it was quite a journey. And I, you know, what I'll say is that, um, you know, it, it's a job where uh, it's, it's good to be able to draw on uh, having done a lot of things, right? So... I got out of law school back in 1990 and worked for a big law firm, Silk Stock and Law Firm. Uh, it's called Linquist and Venom. It no longer exists. It's now Ballard Spar, but it was good to be that. I mean, I, I was around awesome lawyers who just were just really good at, at their job for a number of years and learned a lot from them. But then, you know, I followed the dictates of my heart and went to the Legal Rights Center for about six and a half, six years, five and a half years. And that was a great experience. I learned a lot about, uh, you know, running a nonprofit organization, running a law firm. I was the managing partner at that law firm uh, and, uh, you know, learned a lot about managing people, coaching them, getting the best out of them. And, you know, I litigated my own cases, but I also was in on every case and would be able to talk to people about trial strategy. So that was really helpful. And, you know, learned a lot about how to try cases because I tried a lot of cases on my own, worked on others help people pull together jury selection, help people pull, you know, develop their pretrial motions, what issues were gonna be viable. Uh, and then also worked on a lot of community stuff. So that was good. And then, you know, went on and, and ended, entered uh, private practice again with a few friends, and then went uh, off into state politics, federal politics back to state politics in an executive role. So you asked me about this great, this, this, this century, once in a century pandemic, I felt like I was ready for it because I had walked a lot of, walked a few miles, you know? And uh, I also, you know, uh, you know, to strike somewhat of a somber note, lost my own mom from COVID. So for me, um, it, was, it was not a simple matter of just do this or do that. It's like, I, I know that there were Minnesotans who were uh, attending funerals, right? Uh, I knew that there were Americans attending funerals, people all over the world. There were people sick who couldn't even be with their loved ones. You couldn't hold their hand bedside. So that was something that struck me, you know, just as a person. And I got, um, uh, I got four brothers, there's five of us. And when we buried my mom due to her COVID death, you know, uh, she was very, very, very uh, serious Catholic. And yet the Catholic di archdiocese said, look, we love your mom. She's a pillar of the church, but our policy is that we're not sending any of our priests out there because we just don't do that. This is, and I don't blame them. I mean, this is pre-vaccine. Uh, nobody, it was in Detroit, Michigan, and there were all kinds of, and it was just horrible, right? So, but it was, but those experiences helped me understood one thing. One, you can't shelter in place if you have no place. We must enforce the moratorium. Number two, uh, there are 1,500 bars and 10,000 restaurants. Almost all of them understood the risk to their patrons and their employees. Nine did not. And if they thought I was backing down, they were wrong. And so we, we held them accountable after be literally begging them to comply with the law. They just wouldn't do it. And so we were in a law enforcement role and we did what our job was. Um, you know, we had our budget threatened by the by the uh, majority leader in the Senate, which is uh, unfortunate. But, you know, uh, that's what I guess he thought he needed to do. But at the end of the day, you know, it, the important thing was that uh, we, we did we, 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 we abided by the law. We used compassion and human concern um, that we uh, always remembered that there's there's the convenient thing, there's the expedient thing, there's a political thing, 
And then there's the right thing. And the right thing was to try to save people's lives who and stop the spread of COVID. So that's what we we did. We you know we took some folks to court who tried to take advantage of the moment. You know, you know, uh, with 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 uh, masks and uh, you know and uh, and with uh, eggs and with uh, all kinds of things. We took people to court to stop the price gouging. I will say uh, that Minnesota is one of 13 states that do not have an anti-price gouging um, statute. We had to rely on the executive orders of the uh, governor to, to bring those cases. So that was unfortunate, but uh, we do, but the, but the need for that law still remains. And I, you know, John, I don't wanna go on too long, but I just wanted to tell you that it was a, an amazing moment in, Ameri in American and Minnesota history. Uh, heaven forbid we ever have to go back through that again. By the way, the statutes we relied on were Minnesota statute number nine uh, and, and 12. Uh, and um, what, what we did, I think somebody turned on my, my, uh, my thing there. Can you all hear me? Yes, yep, we can still hear you. Okay. We, we just have a double view of you now. <laughs> okay. There we go, now it went away. All right. <laughs> all right, here you go. And so, you know, the thing is, is that, um, it, it was a it was a once in a century event. We now have a lot more cases. Uh, when when it started, we didn't really have any cases other than the Jacobson case, which is a hundred years old, which had to do with whether or not you can, you know, make somebody comply with a um, smallpox quarantine back in Massachusetts back in the uh, a century ago. That was pretty much all the law we had. Now we have more law, and one of the things uh I've asked our staff to do is to really help pull together and compile what the new state of the law is if there is a non is a peacetime uh, emergency uh, pandemic quarantine. You know what does the law tell us? What does the law say about religious institutions, about schools, about restaurants? What does the law tell us? Get, what is the guidance that we have in order to know what the parameters will be? None of them were in existence before we got started, as I said, except for that hundred-year-old case. So. Yeah, the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a, what a thing. You you identify uh, one, you know, the price gouging statute, a, a law that we need in Minnesota. We do. Um, you know, my my wife always says, never waste a good crisis. Uh, is there additional laws that you you think that we need in Minnesota that? you know, from the experience of the pandemic, you know, for example, the, you know, you can't shelter in place if you don't have a place. Is there right. additional laws with tenant rights, um, you know, uh, things like like that, that that you think we need to get codified? Yes, I do. I think we certainly need an anti-price gouging statute. We do need to change our, our uh, landlord-tenant laws. I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, right now, Let's just say you paid every penny of your rent, but you complain about repairs and you file and, and, and you make complaints to the city about uh, inspections. Your landlord can do a retaliatory eviction against you and uh, take you to unlawful detainer court. And even if you win, that unlawful detainer, or what we call a UD, might stay on your record. I mean, the fact that they filed it. Now, you can get an expungement. But I think that uh, unlawful detainer records should not last longer than a couple of years. Uh, and there should be no record if the matter is resolved in favor of the tenant. Uh, and, uh, you know, but th so that's that's absolutely something that I think is necessary for for us. And, you know, we live in a time when housing is at a premium. You know, you can just look, I mean, if you look at just the price of housing, it has galloped and rent has uh, done the same thing. Uh, people need a place to live, um, and a lot of our and and it's not easy for tenants. One of the things, John, that we started doing that my predecessors didn't do, and that's not a critique. Maybe the need wasn't as great, right? Um, but one of the things we started is a, a group that does nothing but tenants' rights stuff. So we've gotten involved in tenants' issues in Northfield, Marshall, Minnesota. Uh, we got one cooking in Worthington, North Minneapolis. Uh, and we're getting them in every in a lot of other ones, but we get it. We we're and we're suing Havenbrook Homes, and we 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 definitely feel that given the tightness of housing, well, we have to stand up for people. Where did we get? Where did it all start? Well, 
within the context of the pandemic, as you mentioned. So it's certainly something that I think the pandemic has, it didn't, it didn't really, it didn't cause the housing crisis, but boy, did it ever expose the housing crisis. And so there's that, you know, there's other things, you know, that have to do with, um, with, with healthcare access, student loans. I mean, you know, uh, really got exposed uh, in the student, in the uh, healthcare, I mean, in the pandemic. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that you can kind of bump along with outside of a, of a global pandemic. But when you get one, uh, it just highlights the difficulties all the more. Um, you know, one of the other things that uh, legal matters that were highlighted by the pandemic is, you know, how uh, some of the really intolerant things that some politicians said really, you know, exacerbated hate crimes. And we do have a hate crime statute in the state of Minnesota. It is a legal matter. Uh, but, you know, when the, it doesn't help when the president is saying Kung flu or China virus or, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we did see an uptick in violence against um, uh, Asian Americans. You know, we saw it. It was there. And, and, and yet, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we, a lot of times it's not easy to use the hate crime statute. Um, and so uh, that is another thing that this, the pandemic showed me that we need to have something that's easier for prosecutors to use. Um, in fact, there was a horrendous, ugly hate crime in um, Stearns County where a guy um, drove his car into the front of the house of a mixed race cusp couple. Uh, and uh, that guy uh, you know, did it because the husband was a black man. And uh, you know, in that situation, when the, the prosecutor was like, I talked to the local prosecutor, a uh, wonderful uh, prosecutor by the name of Janelle Kendall. And she, was, she told me very frankly, she said, look, man, I can enhance this thing, but if I use the hate crime statute, I can't. It limits the, the amount of time this guy will be exposed to. Um, so, you know, the legislature might want to look at this and then talk to us first. Uh, it's, and so there, it revealed, so the pandemic revealed a lot of things and, you know, I got, and I hope I, you know, so that's, that's a good question. I, I don't think we have really uh, unpacked the pandemic yet, you know, but we really need to. Uh, we yeah. really need to. The psychosocial impact of, of of COVID, I think, has exacerbated crime rates. I think has exacerbated opioid use, alcohol use, suicide. Uh, it's done a lot of things uh, beyond just get people sick. And I think we really haven't taken full stock of it yet. Yeah. I mean, even down to exacerbating the learning gap of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, access to internet. Sure. The kids who had high-speed internet can were able to go to school. Yeah. And you know what, that absolute, that's a, that's a tremendous point because there's a lot of parts of our state that still are, uh, rem are, are um, not wired in, you know, and there's kids who are in areas where they're wired in, but their income level makes it difficult for them to have internet access because of income. So clearly that's on the list, <laughs> you know, yeah. let's put that down. You know, uh, we need, if we're ever going to have a COVID pandemic again, we're going to have to be wired way better than we were. Absolutely. So, you know, the pandemic starts January, you know, in, in the United States in 2020 and, yeah. uh, we're in this really unknown uh, world and, and a lot of folks are scared. And then George Floyd was murdered oh in May goodness. of 2020. Yeah. So true. And um, you took the lead on the prosecution in that case. Uh, tough, tough case with the eyes of the world uh, on you to, to one, you know, amend the charges. And then, uh, you know, it ended up resulting in a conviction. But you, you put together an amazing team uh, who, who worked on that for a long time. You're already working 15, 20 hour days before that happened. And then this, this happens. Uh, can you tell me about first, when you first learned about George Floyd's murder um, and then walking through um, the process of amending the charges and taking over the case and taking the lead on all that? Yeah, well, you know, um... I think it was, I'm an early riser. Now, if it's eight o'clock, I'm, I'm probably going to start yawning on you. But if it's early in the morning, I'm pretty good. So I get up around 530 in the morning and uh, I had, I checked my phone and in the glow of the dark room, I'm looking at this and 
Uh, I see that there's an email from my staff member, a guy named Keon, push the button, and I see this, this, this tape that is just jaw-dropping. And part of it is that it unfolded so slowly and so agonizingly. By midday, it's all the, it's raging. And uh, that was uh, the, 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 the incident occurred on the 25th. By the 26th, midday, it's, it's raging. People hit the streets, they're protesting. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, in, I'm in contact with uh, my friend, Mike Freeman. Here we're talking, uh, and this thing is bubbling. Uh, you know, and you know, and, and we're we're just kind of going back and forth on, you know, what to do. And clearly, uh, you know, uh, Mike is working as hard as he can on it. By that Friday, he's like, "Look, what if we work together on this?" I'm like, "Sure, I think we'd be happy to help." So now we're by Friday, we're 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 a team. By Sunday, the governor says he's appointing me, but we're still a team. And so we work together on it, and you know, we we. Mike says, hey, you look at the look at the whole look, you know, fresh eyes on the case, take a look at it. So we did. And uh, you know, we 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 could find our way to uh we felt there was probable cause for a second degree murder. And then uh unintentional, unintentional. Then we also thought, well, what does uh 60905 mean if this ain't it? I mean, one of them's guarding the guy, one of them's also on the guy's chest, one of them's also on the guy's legs. That's aiding and abetting, if ever there were. So we, we just, char we, we charge it, you know? Uh, and then uh, I was very painfully aware that these cases are not typical, right? And I think we all knew that. You know, one of the things that Mike does is he sends me a book called Freddie's Last Ride, which is an evaluation of the Freddie Gray matter. And that ended up being helpful because the cautionary tale of that book is do not rush to uh, the medical causation, right? Make sure you have a grasp on actually how this person was injured. Don't just say, well, the video shows this, therefore it's this. Um, and so we, we did that. We, we took his advice, uh, took a lot of advice, you know, uh, we, and we pulled together a team. We, we got some, we, you know, the main, the core of the team was the attorney general's office and the Hennepin County attorney's office. That's the core of the team. We had some awesome members, uh, Gene Verdorf, who uh, is just an amazing, amazing appellate mind. Uh, we had Josh Larson, who's a complete and total boondog, smart, aggressive, wonderful dude. Uh, you know, we had the administrative sort of uh, advice of, uh, of Mike and then also Andy Lefevre. So we, 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 we got our core team of government lawyers together. And then, you know, um, I had showed up on the opposite end of the table from Jerry Blackwell enough to know that he was a really good lawyer. And Steve Slisher is a former uh, guy and uh, you know nobody on our team prosecuted the cop before. So Steve Slisher did, um, uh, you know, I, I do know that, you know, Amy Sweezy and Pat Lofton had some other things they needed to do. So we needed somebody who knew what that terrain was like. So we, and then, you know, uh, I, I uh, have over the years have gotten to be pretty good friends with Barry Sheck and Barry says, you ought to have Neil Katyal help you out. This guy's the acting, he's a former acting solicitor general of the United States. And I'm like, and I know based on my 32 years of practice in law, that as a trial lawyer, it's a good idea to have an appellate lawyer saying, oh, watch out for that. Up, oh, watch out for that. And so, because the appellate lawyer is going to look at the case differently. You know, the trial lawyer is looking at, basically, we're looking on how to persuade. Um, but the appellate lawyer is like, well, um, you know, are you going to create appealable issues to have your case flip? You know, and so it was good to have those folks like Gene and Neil Katz, y'all thinking about it. So anyway, you know, we, we, we talk to everybody, we investigate the case, we find more witnesses, and we come up with the, the, the clear idea, you know, the clear idea that what really happened here is that about uh, six or seven people saw a man uh, uh, have three folks get on top of his body and one of them prevent anybody from helping that person. And they pushed his test, chest into the ground so that his 
couldn't really get a breath. You know, if you can't get a breath, you can't take in air that will enrich the blood with oxygen and you can't really expel carbon monoxide. You can't, you, that happens to you for three or four or five or 10 minutes, you're gonna die. And that's what happened to him. And so uh, we really dug into it, but, but it started with the bystanders. We talked to all of them. We understood that the bystanders were a randomly selected group who just happened to be on the corner at around eight o'clock on Memorial Day. And the jurors were also going to be a randomly selected group who just happened to get a jury summons when the case came to trial. And so we wanted to create the bystanders as sort of a group that the jurors might be able to relate to. They were all colors, all cultures, both sexes. You know what I mean? They, they were a diverse group of people and um, they didn't know each other and they didn't know George Floyd. Uh, and so we put them up first and we did want to have the jury see how, not just what they saw, but also how they felt. Now you notice I haven't mentioned the word video yet. Well, because when we pulled the case together, we said, we cannot just play the tape. That is not gonna be good enough. I mean, think about all the cases where you lost, where you had videotape. Rodney King comes to mind. Uh, Walter Scott comes to mind. Uh, there's a lot of them. And so we needed to have people communicating with people. And then you introduce the videotape. Uh, and so we also knew we needed to humanize George Floyd. I mean, George Floyd, uh, if I can just be real about it, uh, you know, a black man, uh, six foot four, 220 pounds. Uh, some people, you know, I mean, it, it might provoke people's stereotypes. He did suffer from chemical dependency and had meth and fentanyl in his blood. But that's not what killed him. And if you watch what happened to him, it's obvious that's not what killed him. Yet we knew that there was going to be a fierce argument from the defense that that's what killed him. So we needed to make sure not only that we prove what killed him and who killed him, uh, and that the use of force was excessive and exceeded the law's uh, allowance and, and, and violated Graham versus Connor and 609.066. But we also had to show that the medical, that, that, that it medically that's what killed them. And so we put the bystanders together with the use of force experts together with the medical experts. And somehow the juror found that we had proven our case. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, I didn't know we were going to uh, get er, get that conviction until the moment Judge Cahill read it in court. I didn't know. People were like, "Well, did you think you were going to win?" I said, "I didn't know. I've seen too many. I've seen too many things go south." You know, I knew we had proven the case, but what I didn't know is if people is if the jurors would accept that we proved the case. Um, so so that so that went down like that, and I can tell you that um, I we we did not you know. One of the things that came clear is that we have a lot of members of law enforcement who really are about protecting and serving. I was so proud to see somebody like Katie Blackwell, who is a trainer, uh, get up there and talk about how she did all she could to train the officers properly. And uh, we saw, uh, you know, folks like, uh, you know, Chief uh, Arredondo get up and say, that's not what we teach, that violates our rules. And, uh, you know, honestly, you know, a guy like Derek Chauvin did a, did a lot of damage to the reputation of law enforcement. And hopefully what we did is try to show the public that the system can police itself, can hold itself accountable. Uh, and that, yeah, you got some people who do the wrong thing, but um, there are people who operate within the system willing to hold those folks accountable. That's not to say we don't have some systemic problems. But the systemic problems aren't limited to law enforcement. We've got systemic problems, and I'm talking about racial problems in housing, you know, and in, in the economy, in healthcare, and you know, obviously, you know, this aspect of uh, American life and policing and corrections and criminal justice has that historic legacy as well. Um, but we can do the best we can with what we have and do all we can to restore that institution. And I was proud to be part of it. I think that we do need to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. We do need to make sure that we make uh, better hiring decisions. We need to make sure that we have a better system of accountability. We've got to make sure that we uh, are continuing to recruit. One of the things that 
law enforcement as a profession is suffering from is uh, we don't have enough folks who want to be cops. And uh, I, I, I always say that it's an honorable profession and you shouldn't let somebody like Derek Chauvin make you believe that it's not, you know, but, but the system has to ask itself, well, then how come you let Derek Chauvin be an FTO, field training officer? And that's a good question. That's an area for reform that we really need to examine. So, well, let me ask you about a, um, something that you're doing to try to help correct systemic uh, problems in the criminal justice system. You started one of the first statewide conviction review units in the country. And I love how you talk to folks about it when you say the only person who benefits from a wrongful conviction is the person who committed the crime. And, and, you know, our, our streets aren't safer. That person is, is out and an innocent person is in prison. Right. Um, so can you tell us about the conviction review unit and the work that, um, that, that you've done to get that up and running and, and, uh, uh, and it's running at full speed now? It is running at full speed now. I do want folks to know that it's not, you can't snap your fingers and have it up and running. It's intensive work. Uh, because what we're, you know, it's intensive work, but we have Carrie Sperling, who has a lot of experience. She ran one of these in, in Wisconsin and got one up off the ground herself. We have a community group, you're part of that, John, that gives her advice uh, on what we should do next. We've been taking in cases and we've been processing them. Uh, I don't want to let any cats out of the bag, but I'll say that in, in the next uh, quarter or so, we'll, you, the world will see that uh, there are some cases that we found. There are not a lot of them. I mean, I think Minnesotans should be, know, should be happy to know that we don't have tons of uh, wrongfully convicted people, but th there are some. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, we are just working. And again, a lot of we're, I'm grateful for some of the folks who push us. There's folks who call me every day, what's going on with this case? I'm like, we're working as fast as we can. I, I'm grateful for those people. We do need to be pushed, right? But I'm also grateful for the folks who understand that you know, it takes time to sometimes untangle the knot, right? And we're also looking at systemic issues. Um, I will say, and I'm speaking only for myself right now, that it had come up over time that the medical examiner who uh, was in, situated in Ramsey County for a while has uh, had uh, a number of cases where, uh, where, where, Judges uh, have come to question that person's um, objectivity. And uh, one of the cases involves the tragic murder of Drew Shadeen. Uh, and the defendant in that case, a guy named Rodriguez, murdered her, but uh, because of some things that the medical examiner said, end up being that case uh, you know, was reviewed. And uh, you know, the judge made some extremely harsh denunciations of the conclusory um, statements that that medical examiner made, but then there was a Douglas County case, and then there was a case in Wisconsin. This guy's associated with flipping a number of cases where he gave opinions, medical opinions, which juries and prosecutors relied on. So we looked at all the cases we had with him, and um, you know we're taking those things seriously. Again, it is important for medical examiners to know that they're not the employee of the prosecutor's office. They are independent and we need them to be independent. I mean, and because you can prove the case or you can't, we don't need any extra help, right? You know, because our country has a bias in favor of liberty. We have a liberty bias in American jurisprudence. And so we say, it's better to let one innocent person, uh, it's, it's, it's worse to, how does that go, John? It's better let, 10 guilt, guilty people go free than convict one innocent person, right, something like right. that. And so what does that mean? That means that we have a bias in favor of liberty. Uh, and so when we take somebody's liberty away and as prosecutors, that is what we do uh, often, it's gotta, it has to be justified. It has to be in the interest of public safety. It has to be just and fair and true. And I don't mind taking that uh, responsibility on. Um, I, I mean, I, again, you hurt somebody, you kill somebody, you rape somebody, you do something that violates our criminal laws, I will uh, step up and prosecute you. But 
Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to get you there. If you didn't do those things, in fact, uh, I view it as our response. That's why, as a prosecutor, we're so fortunate that the law doesn't require us to be only zealous advocates. We're also ministers of justice. We also get to do the right thing just because it is right. And I, I, I love doing that role. But I got to tell you, uh, I wouldn't entrust that to just anybody. You, you know, you need somebody who, you know, is is willing to step up and take the pluses and the minuses of what that means. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing. We're doing a conviction integrity unit. Uh, the, the, it's moving. Uh, we are close to resolution on some matters. Not gonna... Um, nope, you froze up on us there. There we go, you're back. Raise expectations and give anybody any dates or any names. Oh, am I back, am I back? Yep, you're back. Um, yeah, no, I, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great thing for Minnesota, one of the only statewide in the country. And, um, with the motto of, like you said, minister, this Minnesota Supreme Court has said over and over, we are ministers of justice as prosecutors and, uh, uh, justice doesn't stop when you get a verdict or it doesn't stop when you get a judgment on appeal. Um, you know, for well, folks if who, I could, if yeah. I could just say, John, Medical science marches on. I mean, we used to think, oh, shaken baby syndrome. Now medical science says, well, not so fast. Did you think about this and that? You know, medical science. I mean, we, we DNA is probably the best example. Yeah. You know, and and so you know we've got to be. I mean, there are you can you can put together a case that makes somebody look guilty, and maybe they are, maybe they're not. We know that eyewitness identifications are not 100%. We know that showing the photo array uh, in a certain kind of arrangement sequentially as opposed to just all four of them together, that makes a difference. There are a lot of reasons why somebody operating in 100% good faith uh, could end up uh, getting wrongfully uh, convicted. Uh, and we can't, so you're right, uh, justice does not stop at the verdict. At the same time, you know, there are people who completely did it uh, and they don't uh, admit it. And that's when we have to prove it. Uh, and But we should do it based on solid evidence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of, you know, solid evidence and, and, and what at least used to be fact, I mean, there's this notion that's developed in the country of, of fake news and facts right. are not actually facts. And you've, you've had to deal with this, I mean, for for a very long time, but it became uh, much more pronounced in COVID and 2020 election and everything that's happened after the 2020 election. How can we have discussions with folks with whom we disagree when facts are no longer facts? Well, we've got to just urgently push facts, right? We There's got to be a group of people who are willing to say two plus two equals four. I mean, I may disagree with Liz Cheney on a whole bunch of things, but I admire the fact that she did not allow people to make her say two plus two equals 17 because Donald Trump said it did, right? I mean, quite honestly, um, that took a lot of guts. Adam Kinzinger as well. Uh, and I'm sure we, we will, we, we, I'd probably disagree with them both on, you know, the proper role of government, taxation, all kinds of stuff. But can we at least agree on the basics? Some people say no, and most people I think say yes, but what are we gonna do about it? I think that given the onset of technology, we need more folks who do fact-checking, more PolitiFact, more, I mean, we need, the FCC needs to say, this is uh, not necessarily reliable. Um, you know, we, we our society has to adjust. Now, we've always had people who lied and made it up and politicians who made it up. And it's always that exaggeration. That's nothing new. What's new is the speed at which that fake story can get around. Uh, and, and, and the fact that we're not as discerning as we could be. Um, I would say, before you retweet something, please read the article and see what it says first. Ask yourself, does this make sense to me? Are there other parts of known reality that this does jive with before I just believe it? Um, if anything makes someone who you don't like 
too much of a cartoonish evil one, maybe it's not telling you the full story. I mean, if somebody, if I get a story that Donald Trump did something awful, that's probably the story that isn't true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, now you should read it, and it's oh, oh wow. And and are you seeing? Are you getting secondary and tertiary sourcing? We've simply got to be better consumers of news, and it it is a real problem. You know, I mean, right now, uh, we've said, we, you know, I mean, look, we had, when I saw the January 6th stuff, I I, I was aghast. A, a, a I was like, wow, really? Really? You want to hang Mike Pence? The vice, you want to kill the vice president because he didn't help you overturn a Democratic election. And again, I served in Congress with Mike Pence. I don't, I don't think there's too many things I agree with Mike Pence on. But to, but to threaten the man's life? I mean, he's a loyal American. He care. He loves this country. Yeah. You're gonna hurt him because he doesn't. I just, I cannot. We have, we we. This is the moment where you cannot be silent about what's right and wrong. You've got to take a position, and if you, and if you take a position, then other people will too. But if your position is, you know, I know that it's wrong for them to say, hang Mike Pence, but I, but I'm not gonna say anything because I don't really like Mike Pence. Who's going to speak up for you when somebody's saying, saying hang you, right? I mean, yeah. I again, I admired John McCain. I'll never forget it. You hear this lady says, well, Barack Obama, Obama is an Arab. And, and you know, who's, uh, J- uh, McCain says, no, 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 no. Don't say that about him. I know that we disagree on a lot of things, but he's, he's a decent person, right? That is, the, and by the way, you know, I'm in politics myself and, you're not, nobody's going to see me uh, making uh, false character statements about my opponent. I'm not going to say true character statements about my opponent. I'm going to say my position is this, his position is that, pick who you want. Um, but for me, it, it, you know, we're not, I want, my goal is to be able to say to my political opponent's family, yes, I ran, I ran hard, but I ran true. And I was trying to be say, fair, and that and and that's we need to we need to elevate our political ethics, you know, and we can't just go in for a tit for tat, you know. Um, it is a, a sign of the times we're in. Um, so anyway, thanks for asking me about that. Yeah, let me ask you a final question. I want to keep you uh, on on track here. I know you're you're extremely busy. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about a lot of really really heavy stuff. Uh, you've had a hard four years. What? In the you know, and the country's divided. What gives you hope for the future? Well, you know, <clears throat> if I may say so, people like the uh, American Constitution Society, people vi- volunteering, signing up, being a part of the solution, um, believing that their agency can improve things. Uh, th- this is the spirit of volunteering and real patriotic devotion to our country and the principles on which it stands, that does lift my spirits up. And this, it makes me feel better, you know? Uh, you know, the fact that, uh, the, you know, we're going we're gonna to have smart people like Gene Beardorf become a judge, that, that's good news. So if you're cynical, think about that. You know, good people getting into responsible positions uh, is a good thing. And so, you know, that's that's my take on it. That's why uh, that helps me get up. And then, you know, young people, you know, I was, you know, talking to a bunch of young folks just the other day who were, you know, all excited about, you know, environmental issues. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be upbeat and positive. So, yeah, there are crazy things. No, here's something for to to make you feel better. Members of Congress used to be so bad that they had to ban dueling in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Happened. Yeah. At least we ain't had no duels. <laughs> 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 you know? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you know, I mean, that's, just, you know, look, if you think things are so bad now, they think people have always been nuts. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, you know, a guy named Preston Brooks, beat Charles Sumner with a cane so bad that the man needed 
to have months to recuperate. We haven't had anything like that. But my but what's my point? My point is, yes, is things are rough and they're tumble. We got fake news. We got pandemics. We got racial reckonings. But we also have an opportunity to make this country and this state better every single day. So let's do it. Thank you, Attorney General, for, for doing it. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Appreciate your work. And please keep taking care of yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. You bet. You too, John. Thanks a All lot, right. man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Likewise. Bye-bye.